So welcome back to our studies. Our last study, we looked at the 144,000 of Revelation chapter seven. Uh, we had an issue with recording. And so we had to re-record that and that should be posted very soon um, for you to review. Uh, but about the 144,000, we discovered that this special group is faithful to God, even though everyone else at that time uh, will follow the beast. That's that group that, that uh, after the close of probation, they're the only faithful group alive on earth. They live through the plagues. They're not martyred. Um, they're sealed before the close of probation, and um, they ex experience the plague. So it's a special group out of the remnant. We discovered the rest of the remnant either lose their lives, they're laid to rest, uh, and then they join. They will come up and join that group um, at the uh, first resurrection. The group that will be raised to meet the Lord in the air, but the 144,000 are the group that are alive. They're changed in a moment. And this group is faithful to God because ba basically what it says is that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. So that's an important thing for us to understand is Jesus walked the path before us and the destination is in heaven. And if you follow Jesus, Wherever he goes, that will be your destination too. Unfortunately, many will follow the devil and they'll end up in the place prepared for him. But if you follow Jesus, then you end up where he will be. And today we're going to study the seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 8 through 11. And I mentioned through 11 because the seven trumpets, let me give you a little overview. There are seven trumpets, and we're going to study the first one today. Um, and these are such a massive topic that each topic will be a trumpet. There are also two introductory scenes, uh, two, um, if I will, um, scenes in the middle um, that are actually more about the fifth and the sixth trumpets. These are chapters 10 and 11. Um, so we're going to cover those in, uh, in their own studies as well. Uh, so I want to encourage you to, uh, to be with us through that. So the seven seals and the seven churches are often presented as topics of Bible study. But you think about how many times that you've You've either heard or been to um, prophecy studies in Revelation, how many times the seven trumpets are touched on. They almost are never studied in public evangelistic series. And the reason is uh, many do not understand the symbols that are presented in them or how to interpret them. Um, oftentimes, people will take them out of context. They will apply them to the future which completely distorts the timeline that they're presenting. <clears throat> what we need to understand is that there are a third view of the same period of time that the book of Revelation examines in the seven churches and the seven seals. And it begins in the time of the apostles and it ends at either the second coming of Christ in the case of the seals or the trumpets, um, or the, the close of probation with the seven churches. And what's unique about this is, okay, so the seven churches are the Holy Spirit speaking. The seven seals are God the Father speaking, his perspective. And the seven trumpets are Christ. So each member of the Godhead or Trinity um, covers this same period of time before we get into future end time prophecy. So that's important for us. That's why they are presented a little differently because each member of the Godhead or Trinity has a different role to play in the process of salvation. So Christ being the judge um, these are judgments, um, and we're going to look into that in, in just a moment. 
Um, notice that these trumpets are fascinating. Notice their imagery, okay? So you have um, grass and trees and fire and blood and hail, mountains burning with fire, locusts that look like people and the drying up of the great river Euphrates. And these intermediary scenes, as I mentioned before, help us that examine the rise of a power that made war against the papacy, wounded it, um, the trials of God's advent people, and the, especially this power in Revelation 11, because it's still ruling today. So it's our prayer that is you study these with us and study them on your own. You not only find them informative, but it will encourage you to draw closer to Jesus as never before. So we're going to start with Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so the prophet John sees seven angelic messengers stand before God, and they're given seven trumpets. Now, first of all, we need to look at what the meaning of a trumpet is in the Bible. So trumpets were used in several different ways in the Bible. We're going to look at four of them. First, a trumpet was used for war. And we find an example of this in Joshua chapter 6, um, starting at verse 12. Um, this is around Jericho, when they used trumpets for war, um, when they attacked and conquered Jericho. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And in the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days, but it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Do verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted it with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Notice how the trumpet was the key. Um, the trumpets were the announcement that God had given them the city. God had fought and God had taken the city for them, all right? So it's used for war. The second thing trumpets were used for was announcing something. In fact, this is the most common uh, thing that trumpets are used for throughout the Bible. And we have some verses here for you. Um, they'll not only be in your study guide, but also in that outline of Bible texts we sent out. Um, the first one is Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seven month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. Okay, so the trumpet blasted on the, on the Jubilee um, to announce that it wasn't the day of atonement. It was the time of Jubilee, that, that one year in 50 when the Jubilee would happen. N next, we have Numbers 29, verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. For you, to you, it is a day of blowing the trumpets. Okay, so that's the what was also known as the Feast of Trumpets. It announced the coming of the Jubilee or the coming time of judgment. And we know historically um, the Advent movement uh, that gave the three angels messages, that's the fulfillment of that. It's the announcement that the time of his judgment has come. And, um, and that is what that announcement was. 
How about Joel chapter 2, verse 15? Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. Okay, so there uh, a lot you hear a lot of talk about revival in the church. This is speaking of that future time of revival when God's people are under attack by the power of the king of the north at that time. And the trumpet will sound calling God's people back and there will be a humbling of heart. Uh, the, and God himself has a voice like a trumpet. And it's going to be heard the day when Jesus returns to gather his people. God's voice is that trumpet that people will hear. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. In verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. When it was that trumpet that the people were hearing, they were hearing the voice of Christ, the, the God who descended on the mountain, who spoke the Ten Commandments to them. Uh, now let's look at Psalm 47, verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Okay, that verse helps you understand the next verses that she's going to read, which are when the Lord comes back. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 are parallel to this. Notice when this resurrection and this changing of the living righteous or the 144,000 that we studied about last time takes place. It takes place when something sounds, when the voice of God speaks and it sounds like a trumpet. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Okay, so when the voice of God sounds like a trumpet, it announces that's it, that's the end. Um, and God's people will be caught up together with him. And the earth will be emptied of all the righteous. We all know, we know the wicked will perish because of the brightness of the Lord's coming. And the devil will be imprisoned here. And that is, uh, we keep touching on this, but that is a future study um, that we have. So trumpets were used for war. Trumpets were used for announcing. And the third thing trumpets were used for was in the worship of God. Now, I want you to think about that. God's people worshiped him by playing the trumpet. Second uh, Samuel chapter six, verse 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Okay, so we know that there is a time for joy and reverence in the worship of God. It should always be uh, solemn and reverent, but there is a time in the worship of God, along with being reverent, there's a time of joy. They were bringing the ark back, showing that God was among his people uh, again. Uh, Psalm chapter uh, 150, verse 3, is another example of worship trumpets used in worship. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. All right. So God instruments were to be used. God's people would play the trumpet. Now, let's look at the final thing that trumpets were um, used for of the four. And this is going to tie into our study. They were signified judgments of God against those who were who fought against his people 
and who were his people's enemies. Hosea chapter 8 verse 1 is an example of this. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Notice it's a judgment in Amos chapter 2 verse 2. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound. Okay, so that's what I, that's what we need to talk about. The seven trumpets are judgments against God's enemies. Okay, we need to understand that the trumpets are judgments against God's enemies. Uh, Mom's going to read you Revelation chapter three. Uh, 8 verses 3 through 5. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it up with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Okay, so we have the seven trumpet, the angels with the seven trumpets. And then we have this other angel, this, this being, this messenger. Um, and these verses describe the place where the trumpets took place, okay, in heaven. So we've walked through the sanctuary, and we're continuing to walk through it. We've been at the candlestick. We've been at the uh, table of showbread, God's throne. But the seven trumpets now introduce us to a different place in heaven. It introduces us to the alt heaven's altar of incense, because that's we followed Jesus in the prophecy, and he's moved from the candlesticks to the throne of God, to the heaven's altar of incense. And this is where the prayers of God's people on earth were heard by him in heaven. Remember that in the fifth seal that we studied, God's people cried out for justice and their plea was heard by God. So as we've mentioned in our previous studies, from the perspective of God the Father on his throne in heaven, the altar of incense in heaven's temple was at the right side of God's throne. And Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56, describes Jesus as ministering at the right side of God's throne. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Okay. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 also describes Jesus as ministering at the right side of God's throne. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, so what this means is that the seven trumpets are presented from the point of view of Jesus, our great high priest in heaven. Remember, I talked about this earlier, but let me just mention it again. Seven churches presented from the point of view of the Holy Spirit, the seven seals from the Father's perspective, and the seven trumpets presented by Jesus. So before getting into the end time part of the book of Revelation, all three members of the Godhead speak to the church, um, and they cover the same period of time, the days of the apostles, until the end of the world. So this is important because without understanding the seals, the churches, and the trumpets, we can never understand the end time events. We have to understand the historical events that took place in order to shed a light on what end time events are going to be like, okay? 
So if people skip over these, if they put them in a different place um, than where God intended them, they miss the meaning of these, and they also miss the meaning of end time events. That's why we covered these. That's why God goes over these in great detail three different times. Uh, and this is Jesus pulling back the curtain of time to reveal events that in John's day, they were still future, but they're a part of history in our day. Okay, so now let's examine this angel. So we know that these trumpets are from the point of view of Jesus. We know they take place at heaven's altar of incense. Who is the angel that offered the prayers of the saints at the altar? Notice that this angel offers incense representing the prayers of the saints before God. In the Old Testament sanctuary system, only the high priest could offer incense on the altar. And we find that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Okay, so, and then Hebrews chapter 8, 1 and 2 tells us who the high priest in heaven is. Now, this is the main point of the things that we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer on it. Okay, so uh, this high priest could only be the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you're seeing, you're seeing the, the angel who is the high priest of heaven's temple offering the prayers of the saints um, at the altar of incense, okay? Now, that means that this angel is Jesus because Jesus is the high priest of heaven's sanctuary. Now, many get hung up on this point. They get confused by the idea that the Bible refers to Jesus as an angel here in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. But when you study the word angel, it comes from the Greek word agalos. And agalos means messenger. That's all that word means. Now, sometimes God uses human messengers. Uh, and an example of that are the three angels of Revelation 14. Those are the human messengers symbolic of the human messengers that God uses to spread those messages. We'll get into that more later in our studies. There are sometimes the messengers are literally angelic beings that we think of as angels um, that God uses. And at times, the Lord himself has been a messenger to human beings. And I want to show you an example of that. In Judges chapter 13, starting in verses 2 and 3, God himself is the messenger, the angel here. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now you are barren and have borne no children but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now let's skip down a few verses to chapter two, verse 17. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord and did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. 
when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel, that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. Okay, so notice the angel, uh, and in many Bibles that uh, angel is capitalized, the angel of the Lord, um, ascended in the fire. He refused to tell Manoah his name. Now, in the Bible, when angels appear, most oftentimes they do tell uh, people their name. For example, when Gabriel appeared to Daniel and when he later appeared to Mary, he said, I'm Gabriel. You know, he didn't say, why do you ask my name? It's secret. No, he, uh, he, this angel here was different. He accepted worship. He ascended in fire. And notice what Manoah called him. He said, we are going to die because we've seen God. That angel was the Lord himself. That messenger was God. How do we know? And in Revelation 8, 3, Jesus is referred to as the messenger who offers the prayers of the saints before God. Now, one more question. How do we know it's Jesus? Well, the question is, who offers the prayers of the saints before God? Three verses, passages in scripture tell us who it is. First is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, who, who's the mediator who offers the prayers of the saints? It is Jesus. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you look at that and think about that. How, how would Jesus know what we pray if he's not offering those prayers before God? All right. He offers our prayers. And Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So Jesus is the one who offers our prayers before God. Notice when she read in Revelation chapter 8, 3, 3 through 5, that he not only offered the prayers of the saints, but he offered it in a censer filled with fire, okay? Now, this fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Remember how in the book of Acts, um, when the Holy Spirit descended at the day of Pentecost, he appeared as tongues of fire. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit also aids Jesus in offering our prayers before God the Father. And that's found in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so the Holy Spirit aids Jesus. We offer these prayers that are selfish, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit clean them up because they, they see the intention of our hearts and they know and they offer them to God so that, that they're acceptable to God. They offer them according to the will of God. So remember that when we offer prayer, we don't know what to pray for, but we have two members of the Trinity to aid us in offering those prayers to the third member who give, delights to give us gifts, the gifts that we need to aid us in this life so that we can be saved in God's kingdom. All three, all three desire our, us to be saved. Let's look at these two distinct periods of time in this 
Um, Mom's going to read one more time, Revelation 8, 3 through 5. Um, I want you to see there are two different events here in, in this prophecy. Then another angel, having the golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Okay, so that's event one. This angel a messenger representing Jesus commences his ministry and begins offering the prayers of the saints. Now look, she's going to read verse five. The second event takes place. Then the angel took to the earth, and there were noises. Okay, so in the beginning of the ministry of Christ, the intercessory ministry of Christ, um, the commencement of the ministry first, high priestly ministry in heaven at God, the seven trumpets take place in between that. And the third, the last period of time is at the close of probation, around the time of number seven, when Jesus hurls the center to the earth, and you see events similar to what take place in the, seven, the seventh plane. And that is two different events, okay? That's the end of the intercessory ministry of Christ. Mom's going to read you. Um, Revelation 16, 18. Notice how similar this is to Revelation 8, 5. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on earth. Okay, so that is the relationship between the trumpets and the last plagues. The trumpets take place uh, right, right when people have opportunity to learn or repent from these judgments. The plagues take place after probation is closed, when people have made their decisions and there's no longer any time for repentance. So Jesus is judge. The seven trumpets are seven judgments that fall on the earth before Jesus comes again. They're partial judgments. And the reason for that is it says the seven trumpets fell on one third. In the original language, it is translated as one in three parts. That didn't mean one third. To the ancient mind, what that meant was they're partial. They affect part. Whereas the seven last plagues are worldwide judgments. So those who refuse to repent of uh, of the events um, that take place during the seven uh, trumpets that encourage us to repent. This is what could happen. Um, they will reap the rewards of the seven last plagues. They will, um, they will experience that because they've decided, I don't care what the Holy Spirit tells me, I'm still going to fight against God and his people. So remember, repentance is still possible during the trumpets because Jesus is serving as high priest in heaven's temple. But during the seven last plagues, worldwide judgments take place after probation has closed. And human beings who have rejected the warnings have sealed their fate by rejecting the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is removed from them but not from God's people who are sealed, friends. Because remember our last study that we found that it was the spirit that sealed the people of God? The Holy Spirit is part of that seal, all right? So the Holy Spirit will never be removed from God's people. He will only be removed from those who reject the Holy Spirit, all right. Now, with all that in mind, with all the context in mind, let's examine the first trumpet. And that's Revelation 8, verses 6 through 7. 
So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Okay, so notice that one part in three of the trees, all the green grass was burned up. You have fire and hail and blood and it's just very, uh, a very uh, disturbing imagery. Now, how do we take this? Okay. Is this literal or symbolic language? Are you really going to see hail and fire and blood fall out of heaven and all the tree, all the grass is burned up in one third of the trees? Now, that would be very dramatic, but how would that affect human beings? Um, unless we understand that these are prophetic symbols that represent a divine judgment that took place in history against the enemies of God's people. So here we have five symbols. We have hail, fire, blood, trees, and grass. So now let's look at what they mean, okay? The Bible describes, let's start with the hail, the blood, and the fire. The Bible describes the hail and the fire mingled with blood as being the destroying judgment by God against the literal nation of Israel for the killing of his people and his son. So let's look at what these symbols represent. There were two times when Israel experienced divine judgments. The first was in 586 BC, when the Babylonians came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. It was described as divine punishment against Jerusalem, and the Bible portrays it as a censer being thrown down. Notice the interesting imagery here, and the city being burned with fire. So mom's going to read you some passages out of the book of Ezekiel and out of 2 Chronicles. We'll start with chapter 10, verse 2, Ezekiel 10, verse 2. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, go in among the wheels under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in and I watched. Then it happened. When he commanded the man clothed in linen saying, take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, that he went in and stood beside the wheels and the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who took it and went out. And the likeness of their faces was the same as the faces which I had seen by the river Shebar their appearance, and their persons. They each went straight forward. Okay, so now let's look at Second Chronicles 36, um, verses 14 through 23. These are when these events actually happened. Um, Ezekiel was a contemporary of these events. Um, God gave him this prophecy, and this is the fulfillment of that. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God rose up against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious possessions. 
And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Okay, so you notice how the people of Israel turned their back on God. Nebuchadnezzar came, he punished the people. God allowed him to punish the people. Um, and there was a lot of blood, a lot of people died, and f- the fire was along with it. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed and burnt, okay? Uh, we know that in the book of Daniel, that da- the prophecies of Daniel are further explained in the book of Revelation. So this was past. The, seven, the first trumpet is not the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, but there are lessons from the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC that point to the event depicted by the first trumpet. So we've covered what the blood and the fire are, divine judgments. There's shedding of blood, there's destruction. Now, what does the hail represent? I want first, let's look at the blood and the fire and the hail in the book of Revelation against those at the end of time. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And great hail fell from heaven and fell upon each man, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Okay, and how about chapter 20, verse 10? The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night. All right, chapter, uh, let's go verse 14 and 15. The death, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Notice how there's hail, there's blood, there's fire. These are judgments of God. Okay. Now, let's look at the hail in particular. In the Old Testament, the judgment of hail fell against Egypt because Egypt oppressed God's people. This is another judgment and destruction. So Exodus chapter chapter 9, verses 22 through 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there will be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. The hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So notice God's judgments fell on those who persecuted and killed his people. So what simply are the hail, the blood, and the fire? Well, the hail is the destructive force caused by this judgment, okay? Um, In 586 BC, that would have been the power of Nebuchadnezzar that came and crushed the nation of Israel. In um, the blood is the death caused 
uh, on those who oppressed God's people. And the fire is the is another symbol of destruction that accompanies the hail and the blood. As Israel fell into sin and persecuted God's faithful people, the later prophets of the Old Testament increasingly applied the fire, the blood, and the hail on apostate Israel because she had forsaken the covenant. As for the blood, we find it used in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, applying to judgment against the Jews for their apostasy in Jerusalem. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Okay, so notice that blood, blood is used for destruction and judgment. All right. And I want you to remember something. OK, tuck that behind one ear about the apostasy in Jerusalem. We know that in the Old Testament that God sent prophets, but there was one particular person that God sent to warn Jerusalem, especially but Israel, but especially Jer the city of Jerusalem um, later after Israel returned to the promised land after the Babylonian captivity, there was one particular messenger and that was the Lord Jesus himself. So we need to apply these words, um, these judgments in things that Jesus said. But before we get into that, let's interpret what the Bible says about the symbols of trees and grass. So the Bible gives us many verses that represent, tell us what grass represents. Remember that grass uh, and trees are also symbols, just like fire, blood, and hail. So who these symbolize who the judgments fall on, okay? Just like the judgments are the fire, the blood, and the hail, who these symbolize who they fall on. First, grass. Let's start with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Okay, this is one thing I love about the Bible is that it interprets itself. What does the grass represent? People. Okay, now what kind of people? Um, let's look at Psalm chapter 37, verses 1 and 2. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they soon shall be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Okay. Uh, the grass represents the wicked. Uh, if you look throughout that chapter, Psalm 37, it's describing the final destruction of the wicked. And it talks about they're going to be cut down. They'll disappear. They'll be destroyed time and time and time again. But let's take you to some other Psalms. Psalm chapter 90, verses 5 through 7. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. Okay. And Psalm chapter 92, verse 7. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. So friends, understand um, this. Oftentimes it talks about how you see and you wonder, well, God, how come these wicked people are allowed to flourish? And the Bible says, ah, don't, don't worry about that. God has that under control because there is coming a day when just as, and, and you you can see at any time, um, no matter how high a yard can get, if you mow it down, it, it's cut down in an instant when you mow your yard. And it's going to be the same thing for the wicked. No matter how high they think they can get mighty in power, the Lord has the ability to cut them down like grass. 
And this judgment is telling us that, remember, this is a partial judgment, one part in three. So it's describing a judgment that fell on a particular place in the, thir in the first uh, trumpet, that the wicked perished, the destruction, the grass, it fell on this, this wicked. Um, what about trees? Okay, so we know the wicked, but the tree is telling us what nation this fell on. Jeremiah eleven sixteen through 17. The Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and for the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. Okay, so who's Jeremiah writing to? He's writing to Israel. Israel is this tree. Ezekiel 15 verses 6 and 7. Ezekiel also, um, God sent as a prophet to the nation of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire to another fire, and the other fire will devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus, I will make the land desolate because they have perished in unfaithfulness, says the Lord God. Okay, chapter 22, verse 31. I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skillful to destroy. Okay, this is uh, describing the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. But it also applies to another event. Um, the, the first trumpet does. God, so the Apostle John, knowing the Old Testament the way he did, he would have known exactly who God was talking about, what event this was. We have to unpack this a little bit more, friends, because we live 21 centuries after, you know, this event. So we need to understand this. Another one is Psalm chapter 80 verses 8 through 11. And we're not trying to skip over the, these words, but I want you to take them in. If God were to say this to you and I, this would be terrifying for God to say this to, to a nation, to people, and that a nation has become so arrogant and a people so arrogant that they forgot the God who has planted them and made them flourish like a tree. And God is saying in a second, I'm going to chop you down. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Skip to verse 15. And the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself, it is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Okay, notice what God called Israel. It ca he called it not only a tree, but he called it a vineyard. Now tuck that behind one ear because we're going to get into that in a moment. So Israel had these 490 years of probation. We, we learned that in the book of Daniel. So God sends other prophets. Uh, he sent John the Baptist and he sent Jesus, who Jesus was not only a prophet, but he was also God. In the New Testament, John the Baptist compared Israel with a tree and warned that if the tree did not bear fruit, it would be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will cut, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Notice how... John isn't referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. He's referring to a future event. And keep that in mind. He's referring to the first trumpet. He's referring to a future event, a future destruction of, of Jerusalem. Notice now, now the second messenger, the ultimate messenger that God sends to his people in was the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 13, verses one through six, Jesus gave a parable of a fig tree representing the Jewish nation. And he predicted that if it did not bear fruit, it would be cut down. Notice what Jesus said. There were present at that season, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and when he came seeking fruit on it, he found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for these three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Okay, so notice that Jesus and John the Baptist both predicted the future downfall of the Jewish nation for not bearing fruit. This would mean they did not fulfill the mission of God, the Jewish nation, and they killed God's servants just like the Jewish nation did prior to the Babylonian captivity. Now, I want you to notice the sentence that the rulers, uh, the leaders of the Jewish people in the days of Christ pronounced on themselves. So Jesus gave this parable of a vineyard representing Israel. He talked about how uh, God had planted it. He sent his servants to reap it. They killed the servants and beat them. So last of all, he sends his son and they killed the son and they treated him horribly now notice what they themselves said this is matthew 21 verses 41 through 43 jesus said therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those vine dressers they said to him he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dresser who will render to him the fruits in their seasons Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And we know that nation was spiritual Israel, those who would accept Christ, those who would follow Christ. So friends, what happened was that the the parable the first trumpet is this the trees and the grass represent the people of the apostate nation of Israel they killed Jesus and 
his servants. This is depicting the beheading of James, the brother of John, um, who was the first apostle killed. And even though the Jews had ceased to be God's chosen people in AD 34, God still exhibited kindness and patience toward his wayward ch children, but his patience was sadly rejected and instead used to enact hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus. And here are several passages in the New Testament um, that describe how the Jews, yes, we know the Romans put God's people to death, but we also know the Jews instigated it. Acts chapter 9, verses 22 to 25. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelled in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, let him down through the wall in a large basket. Okay, um, we're going to read you one more. There are, I have several passages in your, uh, in your study guide and examples throughout the Bible about how the Jews um, inspired and in, uh, deliberately tried to instigate the Roman authorities into killing God's people. So let's do Acts chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. Um, and, and then let's move on. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. And friends, that's what happened, okay? When the Jews rejected the message, God gave the message to the entire world. That's what Jesus said would happen. So as a result of their heinous acts against the people of God, the Jews rejected the last offer of mercy from God. God withdrew his protection from them and removed his restraining power from Satan and his angels. And the nation, the literal Jewish nation, was left to the control of the devil who they had chosen as their ruler. That's why you can actually see that when Pilate said, who do you want me to set free, Jesus or Barabbas? Jesus was a representative of God. They rejected God and his representative and chose the representative of Satan, Barabbas. It was, it depicted what the people would do, what they were doing. And after Jesus returned to heaven, we know that there was another three and a half years. They killed the apostles of Christ. They killed the disciples. They killed the Christians. And God left them to the ruler that they had chosen, the devil. And their stubborn rejection of Jesus and his servants, the Jews experienced the sentence that they had pronounced upon themselves in Matthew 27, 25. It's, it's a very sad, sad pronouncement. Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. But this is what they said. Um, Pilate says, what do you want me to, what do, you want me to do? Um, I'm innocent of this blood. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Okay. So friends, before we identify the event when this took place, let's look at the timeline one more. Okay, the seven churches, the seven seals begin in the time of the apostles. So therefore, the seven trumpets must take place in the time of the apostles. So we're looking for a judgment that fell on the nation of Israel for their persecution of God's people. We're looking especially the city of Jerusalem, where most of the persecution took place. And this event this first trumpet had to have taken place in the first century AD. So is there an event that took place that fell upon the oppressors of God's people in apostolic times? And there is one. 
See, this is the only event that is passed to John. Remember, John is writing, you know, about 95, 96 AD on the Isle of Patmos. This event had already taken place. But every trumpet after this is future for John. God took John back in time. The destruction of Jerusalem under the Roman armies, by the Roman armies under the command of Titus. Okay. Um, I want to read you some quotations describing this event um, by the 18th, his, 18th century historian. This, this guy wrote in the 1700s. His name was Milman. And um, his book was The History of the Jews, Book 16. All right. It says the leaders of the opposing Jewish factions at times united to plunder and torture the wretched victims. Remember, friends, that they had rejected Christ. The Holy Spirit was removed from their nation. And when he did, the, um, the devil took over. They reflected the spirit of Satan. Um, I'm going to go on. And again, they fell upon each other's forces and slaughtered without mercy. Even the sanctity of the temple could not restrain their horrible ferocity. The worshipers were stricken down before the altar and their sanctuary was polluted with the bodies of the slain. Yet in their blind and blasphemous presumption, the instigators of this hellish work publicly declared that they had no fear that Jerusalem would be destroyed for it was God's own city. To establish their power more firmly, they bribed false prophets to proclaim, even while Roman legions were besieging the temple, that the people were to wait for deliverance from God. To the last, the multitudes held fast to the belief that the Most High would interpose for the defeat of their adversaries. So what happened in history was that the Jewish people revolted, um, the Romans sent armies and one of the last battles, it was not the last, but one of the last battles was the capture of the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. So the, the Roman, and it was a terrible event, and I'm, I'm going to read about it now. This is what Milman wrote about it. The Roman leaders endeavored to strike terror to the Jews and thus cause them to surrender. Those prisoners who resisted when taken were scourged, tortured, and crucified before the wall of the city. Hundreds were daily put to death in this manner, and the dreadful work continued until along the valley of Jehoshaphat and at Calvary crosses were erected in so great numbers that there was scarcely room to move among them. Like in during the actual battle now, like one entrenched Titus from the crest of Olivet, Titus actually commanded the battle from the Mount of Olives uh, upon the magnificent temple. Uh, he looked upon the magnificent temple and gave command that not one stone of it should be touched. Before attempting to gain possession of this stronghold, he made an earnest appeal to the Jewish leaders not to force him to defile the sacred place with blood. In the struggle that followed, a firebrand was flung by a soldier through an opening in the porch, and immediately the cedar-lined chambers about the holy house were in a blaze. Titus rushed to the place, followed by his generals and legionaries, and commanded the soldiers to quench the flames. His words were unheeded. In their fury, the soldiers hurled blazing brands into the chambers adjoining the temple, and then their so with their swords, they slaughtered in great numbers those who had found shelter there. Blood flowed down the temple steps like water. Thousands upon thousands of Jews perished. The whole summit of the hill which commanded the city blazed like a volcano. One after another, the buildings fell in with a tremendous crash and were swallowed up in fiery abyss. The roofs of cedar were like sheets of flame. The gilded pinnacles shone like spikes of red light. The gate towers sent up tall columns of flame and smoke. The slaughter within was even more dreadful than the spectacle from without. Men and women, old and young, insurgents and priests, those who fought in those who entreated mercy were hewn down in indiscriminate carnage. The number of the slain exceeded that of the slayers. The legionaries had to clamber over heaps of death to carry on the work of extermination. Um, and this is the last quote, because as terrible as that is, I apologize for the 
graphic language of it. I just want you to understand how terrible this was. In the siege and slaughter that followed, more than a million of the people perished. One of the reasons for this is the destruction happened at the Passover time. So a lot of people visiting were were actually killed as part of the destruction of Jerusalem because they were in, they couldn't leave the city because the Romans besieged it. So there were many more people than just the inhabitants. Um, the survivors were carried away as captives, sold the slaves, dragged to Rome to grace the conquerors, triumph, throw to the wild beast in the amphitheaters or scattered as homeless wanderers throughout the earth. So you you can uh, you can read about the destruct the fire and the blood. One of the interesting things is that one of the flags, the symbols of a particular Roman legion that took part in this, was actually hail and ice that was on it. Very graphic, in that the prophet um, that was what he was shown in in the first trumpet. Friends, these are sad words to read about a people who rejected God and his servants. And while more than a million people perished in, this, in the destruction of Jerusalem, not one single Christian died. Okay, and remember, there, there were many Christians who lived in Jerusalem. It was because the Christians remembered the words of Christ almost 40 years earlier when Jesus told them to flee Jerusalem when it was surrounded by armies. Mom's going to read you those words, Luke 21, 19 through 22. But when you see the Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Jesus said, you know the time to flee Jerusalem is near when it's surrounded by armies. Now you think about that, okay? And to the human mind, we're thinking, well, that's kind of ridiculous, because how do you flee a city when it's surrounded by armies? But here's what happened. OK, in AD 66, the Romans surrounded the city of Jerusalem for the first time. OK, that was when the sign happened, not in AD 70, the, in AD 66. And the Christians inside the city knew that this was their sign to flee. The Romans mysteriously withdrew their troops for reasons unknown to historians. You can read that in the history books. They don't know why the Romans, it, they could have taken the city very quickly in AD 66. But for some reason, they suddenly withdrew. And the Jewish armies inside the city chased after them. And in short order, they engaged in battle against the Roman legions and killed many of the Romans and defeated them. So the Jews viewed it as a sign of triumph from God. OK, it enraged the Romans. And when they came back four years later, they avenged that. OK, but while the Jews and the Romans, who both would have prevented them from fleeing Jerusalem, had left the city, the Christians fled it. And they settled east of the Jordan River in Petra, in what is now the, the country of Jordan. And four years later, and they did not return. Even when it looked like things were prosperous, they heeded the sign that Jesus had given them. I want you to remember that, okay? They're even in the midst of all this as the times get closer. There will be times where it appears like times of prosperity. We need to be careful to heed the signs that Jesus give us in the Bible. The, not a single Christian returned to Jerusalem. And when the Roman armies came back four years later and the destruction of Jerusalem happened in AD 70, not a single Christian died because they followed the words and instructions of Jesus. My friends, the destruction of Jerusalem was a terrible event brought on by the stubborn refusal of the the Jews, to listen to the servants of the Lord spreading the gospel to them. In retribution for the killing of his servants, the Lord allowed the Roman armies to destroy these wicked people and burn their city to the ground. This was a fulfillment 
of the first trumpet of Revelation 8, six and, verses 6 and 7. That's the first trumpet, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But the, remember, these judgments are warnings to the world. It's a warning to a wicked world that sheds the blood of God. Servants, repent, or else the same thing can happen to, to you. Friends, we as God's people do not need to be afraid of the destruction that will take place on the world at the end of time. Because God has promised that he will take care of us and that if we follow him, all will be well for us. This is God's promise, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right side and a 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only your eyes shall see it and you shall see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. My friends, we are soon to see events take place in our world that um, will be much, much worse than the destruction of Jerusalem. We're going to see the worldwide destruction of a planet. We're going to see uh, millions of people perish because they refused the love and the mercy of God, because they re refused to heed the warnings in the seven trumpets. But we do not need to be afraid because God will protect us. Jesus loves us so much that he wants us to repent of our sins and follow him all the way to heaven. We need to be careful to listen to his words and watch for the warning signs of destruction that he has told us about. You see that event when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that's a second one, friends. You know what it is? The second event applies to spiritual Israel. It says when you see that event, and that event is the mark of the beast and the final test at the end of time, then we know that God is calling his people out to the solitary places of the earth. Um, that event we need to watch for. We need to watch for it just as the Christians did uh, in in Israel long ago, and they watched for it because they did not get so absorbed in the cares of this life that they failed to be ready for that event, all right? Sometimes we try so hard to oversee our lives when God is the one that should take that place. Friend, trust in God is the cure for anxiety, fear, and doubt. Yes, we may feel helpless, and we will in the crisis to come, but remember that that with God, all things are possible. And if God be for us, who can be against us? God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. And if you've never let Jesus take charge of all aspects of your life, I'm not talking about if you've not made a decision for Christ, but after that decision, it's a learning experience. Sometimes we, we fight God 
for control on the throne because even after we surrender to God, we have to surrender day by day. And if we've never let Jesus take charge of all aspects of our life, let's do it today. It will free us of that doubt and that anxiety and that worry because Jesus is in control. And sometimes it may seem helpless. Remember that God has a beautiful solution. It will be the most liberating experience we've ever, ever seen. And it will be that kind, it will help us to have that kind of faith that we will need to stand through the great times soon to come. Let's pray. Lord, that first trumpet depicts a terrible, terrible judgment that fell on a nation that committed themselves to evil, a nation that decided to reject you, um, a nation that you'd given 490 years of probationary time to, and yes, Lord, another 36 after that, um, that you delayed that, that destruction. But unfortunately, that probationary time was, was mocked and spurned and your people were killed and your son was killed. Lord, we know that we're soon to see a wicked world reap what it has sown. It will, it will perish because of how it's treated you and your servants. Lord, help us not to be fearful now of the things we go through in our lives, to know that when we place our lives in your hands, you're in charge of the big things in our life as well as the little things. God, you know we need what we need to survive. And we, you know that you are in charge of everything. We need to know that you will never lead us wrong. Lord, help us that while we live in this life and while we work and while we plan for the future, help us never to forget that we're to watch the signs of the times just as your people living in Jerusalem did that that same sign, while it will not be a literal army, it will be the devil's army assuming the power um, on earth to try to force the inhabitants to either follow you or follow the beast. And Lord, that test will come upon all. Help us to be ready for it and help us to be ready to heed your call when you say, look, I want you to follow me out here to the solitary places of the earth when that comes, just as the Jews did long ago and not a single one of them perished. Lord, help us to remember that our future is in your hands, but we have to remember and heed your sign. Lord, I pray that you be with us, that we will learn in the good times and in the bad to follow you all the way is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.